I want to talk today about the attitude of continuous practice. <clears throat> this phrase, continuous practice, is one that I've spoken about before, a few months ago. And Dogen has a, a long fascicle called Gyoji uh, on this concept of continuous practice. And I'm just going to scratch the surface of it here. Um, it's not a deep dive, but it, I was drawn to it um, as a kind of extension of what I was talking about last week. Um, for those of you who are here, maybe saw the video. I think, I think the video went up in the last few days. Um, I was talking about working with strong emotions. Yeah. And I talked about <clears throat> ways of working with strong emotions. Uh, the way of mindfulness, and then uh, the way of kind of shikantaza, and the way of koan. I kind of presented a couple of ways to work with it. Shikantaza being to really throw yourself into the feeling, and you know really allow it to really feel it in its in its intensity, and then allow it to turn you instead of you turning it. That kind of approach. And then the koan approach was to kind of investigate the emotion in terms of exploring where the seed was of that feeling. And there's, um, you know, particularly in this latter approach, there's almost like a, an invitation. You're almost like inviting the strong feeling in. In the same way with a koan, if you are working with a traditional koan, we're actually bringing the question up, right? Um, where there, there's an artifice, you could say, to the practice. Bring the question up, repeat it, internalize it, and then find what the intuitive mind, how the, the intuitive mind uh, responds to that inquiry. Yeah. So in, in these ways, there's kind of something that we're working with, I and mean, it's kind of how I phrased it, you know, how to work with the strong emotions. And there, there was a, you know, some things I kind of, in some ways, maybe overstated, or you know, I got some some really valuable feedback from from some of you around, you know, perhaps overstated some things, uh, particularly when we got into the discussion of, um, well, what about trauma? You know, do you throw yourself into into the deep pain that might get elic elicited in traumatic situations? And there were a few good questions and a few good sharings around that. And uh, I shared, for example, that you know I'd been told by a trauma-informed, uh, you know, counselor and practitioner that it's. Uh, I think the words I used were, you know, that people who are deeply traumatized perhaps can't meditate. And those those were the words that actually I, w I was told. But th but those are two. That's too categorical. You know, it's not that they can't meditate. Of course, they they can, but. What I, you know, should have said was that to, to kind of put pressure on someone to stay still and to experience their feelings very deeply to have to any have any sort of pressure around doing that can can be very unhealthy and even diff just extraordinarily challenging, um, even even retriggering for some people. So the um, thing what I want to talk about today kind of gets at the heart of you know this this matter of, of, you know, working with the feelings in a different way. And what I want to talk about is the, the attitude of practice that kind of underlies what I was talking about in terms of working with those strong feelings. And that's this attitude of continuous practice. We all have these kind of basic attitudes. I like, I like this word attitude. For a long time, I, I thought that this was a good way of looking at our practice. And actually, I'm surprised I haven't talked about it for uh, much, uh, because I, I, it's, it's a meaningful sort of concept for me, or a meaningful inquiry for me. What's, what's our basic attitude? What's your basic attitude? Right? We, can, we have basic orientations you know, to the world, to our lives. You could say, um, life's a bitch is an attitude. Um, 
it's all good is an attitude. Optimism is an attitude. Pessimism is an attitude. Realism <coughs> is an attitude. You know, every ism probably has an underlying sort of attitude orientation, even a value system that's uh, inside of it, right? So, you know, I'll actually pause for a second and ask you to reflect on what, what, what's, what, what is or what are some of your core attitudes towards life? Then when you see these, you know, you, we might ask, uh, well, is that really your attitude or is that more something that you want to believe? <laughs> and your basic attitude is even something more deeper. And we have some adopted attitudes that maybe perhaps are ways of coping with the core attitude. So our, our, our Buddhist understanding is that we, there actually is a, a foundational attitude which is based on pain and suffering. And even if our lives are um, fortuitous and favorable in many ways, you know, the Buddha says that all conditioned existence is radically unsatisfactory at its basis. So we, we can look at ourselves and see if we, deep down, you know, have this experience of conditioned existence, unsatisfactoriness. I think the, the more I um, practice and the more I mature as a person, um, I find that this is more my attitude. <laughs> Yeah. I was just reminded of the epitaph of uh, the poet uh, Yeats, William Butler Yeats. Does anyone know his the, on his grave? Yeah, on his grave. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I actually went to his grave one time. You did. Uh, yeah. Um, cast a cold eye on life, on death. Horsemen pass by. That's it. Something. That's it. Yeah, that's it exactly. Cast a cold eye on life, on death. Horsemen pass by. I remember reading that. When I, was, I loved Yeats as a in college and in my twenties. Memorized a bunch of his poems. Uh, you know, very romantic, very creative, very impassioned. You know, poet. And then this was his epitaph: Cast a cold eye on life, on, on death. Our image, you know, Zen image of the leafless tree you know, has something of this attitude to it, I think. And a lot of the older, well, and even Zen teachers that you may know um, have this kind of attitude, I think. It's like, okay, uh, <laughs> this life. So if this is a foundational attitude that we are in touch with, um, you know, what are some other layers on top of that that we might hold <laughs> in order to live with that or not live with that, <laughs> you know, avoid that, we may have some. We'll have these attitudes of controlling, you know, judging, opinionating, Evaluating. Our attitude is almost always has a great concern about what's in it for me. An attitude that's based on what's going to happen to me. What does this mean to me, for me?
maybe you don't agree. I'd, I'd love to chat after the talk, after we set how you feel about that, but I think so. Our, our core attitude is often is oftentimes um, very self-centered, right? So continuous practice, kyoji, it's a shift in our basic attitude towards our life. <clears throat> Norman Fisher has this quote that I came across. Um, it was just a few days ago. I was rereading the introduction to his book, uh, "The World Could Be Otherwise," uh, about the, the Bodhisattva, the Paramitas. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, he says, bodhisattvas don't mind much what happens to them. Their lives are larger than the plans they may have had for them. Their lives are larger than the plans that they may have had for their lives. Their lives are larger than their plans. I guess you could say that. <laughs> yeah. Bodhisattvas don't mind much what happens to them. Mm. How do you feel when you hear that? Is there a bit of a relief? Like, oh, I'd like to feel that way. <laughs> not caring much, not minding much what happens to me. I feel a relief. I feel a little, oh, yeah, I want to be that way. Of course, I'm very concerned about my feelings in that. <laughs> so, let's take heed. <laughs> okay, bodhisattvas. All right, so now it's the attitude of the bodhisattva. The attitude of the bodhisattva. The core attitude of the bodhisattva is to, well, receive all sentient beings. Right? I, just, I just stick right with the first bodhisattva vow to receive all sentient beings. Instead of being so concerned with what happens to us, we accept everything. This is the shift into continuous practice. We accept everything. <clears throat> so we have in our... Um, screensaver or avatar for our uh, Eon Zen Zoom uh, profile, the let go, let come, let be, which was my expression of um, practice, ways to practice with um, the three attachments, the three forms of attachment, the three poisons, you know, uh, clinging, aversion, and ignorance. You know. And these I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift a little bit in terms of instead of calling them ways to practice with, I'm going to say these are the attitudes of continuous practice. Yeah, let go. Yeah. Let go of what you're clinging to and which wants to go. Let come. Let come what is coming, which you want to push away. And then I'm going to say, let be seen. Let be seen. That which remains in darkness and wishes to be seen. Let go of what's coming. No, let, let go of what wants to go. Let come what's coming. And let be seen what wants to be seen. Actually, how about accepting everything even before it comes and letting go even before it's going? Can all three of these actually be one? One attitude. of continual presence, witnessing, 
non-interference, non-grasping. So now it, it, it's not even, you could say, even a practice anymore. Right? There's, there's no, oh, is this coming? Does it want to go? Does it, okay, now I'll let go of it. <laughs> oh, what's, what's coming? What's coming? Oh, okay, I'll let it come. You know, there's nothing like that. There's just radical presence. If you can have that attitude of radical presence, radical non-manipulation, radical non-interference, in what is. You, you have to be present to yourself at a level, you know, deeper than your, your filtered understandings and your, that discursive conversation, you know, that's kind of structuring your awareness. You're present at a deeper level. So it's about embracing, right? It's bracing all the conditions, inner conditions and outer conditions. Embracing them in a, in a soft embrace. Fully encountering. Dogen in the Gyoji, in the Shobogenzo, he's, he's very clear this is not a technique, right? So it's a practice, <coughs> continuous practice, but it's not a technique. Zazen is not a technique. It's more of an attitude. That's what it is. It's an attitude. Dogen says, as a result, the practice, continuous practice, is not done by forcing oneself to do it, and it's not done by being forced to do it by someone else. It's a ceaseless practice that is never tainted by forcing. I just remembered my, my grandfather telling me he was, we were building something. It might have been a model kit or something. He said, don't force it. Don't force it. I just remember that voice in my head. You know, as a, as a little kid, I was probably six or eight. He, he died when I was 10, actually. So, um, I wanna, <laughs> there's a lot of forcing, I think, in, in eight year old boys. <laughs> Force it. So, so, Zazen is this attitude, continuous practice it is the attitude of zazen. It's not a technique, it's not an exercise, it's not a religious observance. It expresses our human dignity and endurance, composure and patience. Full acceptance of whatever comes. It's not a discipline. It's not something external or imposed. It's an expression of our deepest human aspiration. <clears throat> this is why I was happy that um, it was a more advanced you know, group here, a seasoned, a seasoned group here, because when I say it's not a discipline and it's not a technique, you know, um, more beginning Zen practitioners might get confused with the rigor of the practice and to think that it isn't a rigorous practice, but it is a rigorous practice. To maintain this sort of attitude in everything. Right? So in, in a way, Zazen is just the, the easiest way. It, it's a very simple and even easiest way to practice this continuous practice. You know, that's why we're doing seated meditation so much is that it's the, the conditions are just really ripe 
to do this type of continuous practice. But it's not to have that, you know, only for on the, on the cushion, right? This continuous practice has to pervade our entire life. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not a discipline, so it's it's kind of so tricky, right? Because it's always a practice. Okay, oh, you pay attention. You pay attention. Okay, I mean that, that is a discipline, right? But to Dogen's perspective, that's the continuous practice of the universe, <laughs> is you practicing in that way. So when you see yourself, as, it's, it's not you that's doing the practice, it's doing the discipline. It's not you that's doing it. <laughs> then you awaken to this continuous practice as the essence of Zen. So what happens, you know, what's the fruit of this continuous practice? Well, there's, there's, there's a lot to say about this, but what what is um, alive for me right now is that we enter into a living relationship with the universe. Right? All separation, that's, that separation of, that, that is created by that self-sense that we're so loyal to, you know, really dissolves. And we enter into this, this co-creative participatory relationship with the universe. And when we hear the bird song, you know, it's not the bird singing, sound waves moving for the air, our ear, picking it up and sending signals to the brain. That's relative, that's the relative. And that's true in the relative dimension. But in the absolute, it's all one. You know, bird and bird song and you are all co-creating that moment. Uh, this acceptance is, is actually not even passive either, right? These days I'm always saying it's not passive, it's not passive. I think I've said it every talk, the last four or five talks. It's not passive. Right? This acceptance, it's very dynamic. It's very engaged even. And we can even do something with it. These are some of my favorite lines from Rilke, who many of you are uh, also fans of. This is from the Duino Elegies. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, Throw the emptiness out of your arms to add to the spaces we breathe. Maybe the birds will feel the expansion of air in more intimate flight. even let go of all the spaciousness you have. The birds feel it. What's left inside? More, maybe. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, continuous practice. So this is a constant unfolding. Just a constant, constant unfolding. Just to be one with this 
ever present generation in life. Okay, I hope that was inspiring. I'd like to have a talk after we said on your attitudes. Thank <laughs> you.